We are joined now by the great Yogi Roth from the Pac-12 Network. Yogi, I know this is very bittersweet. The last game in the Pac-12 as we know it between, I guess, two future Big Ten teams. But finishing this year with this matchup feels feels right. Yeah, yeah, you're you're exactly right. I mean, I think when you and you know, you've covered this league for for so long. I've been out here for over twenty years now, and these two brands they're synonymous with the pack, right? Pack eight, pack ten, pack twelve, whatever. And the last two years, they, they just provided just moments that everybody around the country remembers. Like everybody knows the whole shot Michael Penix threw a year ago mm -hmm. in Autzen that eventually would win the game. Everybody knows about the game this year, and whether it's the fourth down calls for Oregon or the audible at the goal line from Penix to Adunze to basically win the game or the missed field goal. Like there's just moments. And, and I think this is going to continue that. It, it's become one of the great rivalries, I think, nationally in a short period of time. To your point, it's going to only continue. And it's kind of fitting. You know, the last couple of years in Vegas, uh, you were there. It, it's off the charts. It's so loud. It's electric. It's been a sellout every single time. And it was Utah. They always brought a crowd. Yeah. And then SC resurgence. This is going to be, I think, another level because of the pure hatred among the two schools, right. as well as what is at stake. We're talking about CFP birth or births. We're talking about at least the conversation around it. We're talking about a Heisman winning quarterback, I think, potentially could come out of this thing. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot, uh, and probably even, you could argue, your Big Ten pseudo favorite moving yeah. into next year because these two programs aren't slowing down, and there's going to be big changes with the veteran-laden Michigan team. Uh, I don't think Ohio State has looked like either one of these teams this right. season. So there, there's a lot. There's a lot to, to to digest when Friday night comes and then probably in the aftermath. Well, and, and the the hatred, uh, that's the, the rivalry piece of this is so interesting. Like you talk to Jeff Schwartz or you talk to people who played at Washington and they'll tell you like this is the rivalry, even though they, there's the Civil War and the Apple Cup. It, I, I explain to people in other parts of the country, it's kind of like Florida, Georgia, where – Florida has Florida State and Georgia has Georgia Tech. And yes, they've hated each other for a long time, but it's not the same kind of hatred. And it feels like it's it's a similar situation with Oregon and Washington. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're working on a video that'll that'll air in pregame, uh, which will be great because it's got the moments. Right, The, the first game between these two was in the year 1900. Oh my God. I mean, they, they weren't called the Ducks and the Huskies way back when. And then I, the first memory that, that I really have that stands out, you know what I'm talking about. It's the Jake Locker. It's the point. Oh, right? yeah. When they roll. Yep. The Ducks with Mark Helfrich and, and Helfrich and Chris Peterson are like so close of friends. And you could just see it in Coach Peterson's eyes like, oh, we're just, you know, putting it on this program right now. But that was the time where, where Washington, I think, like flexed again. And here yeah. came that team and their CFP birth, et cetera. And then here came Oregon, uh, you know, the next couple of years. It's, it's been beautiful to watch this thing. And, and I think it's really well coached, too, in terms of who Kalen DeBoer is and what he's done yeah. in his career at any level. And then what Dan Lanning's developing into. I mean, not, it's not just the way he's recruiting, but you watch the way that he's motivating his team. I mean, the job he's done, it needs to be noted because Colorado got all the play with the transfer portal and then it was Arizona State. But the third most new players on a roster was Oregon this year. Mm -hmm. So to get them to play together like they have, especially in the secondary, in the back end, to me, has just been phenomenal. Even at wide receiver, uh, Troy Franklin should get all the play. Uh, I think he got absolutely hosed, not being a finalist for the Blitnikoff Award. But they've had to add some new faces to some of those key positions in a very athletic Pac-12. And they've thrived. The back half of the season, this team has been rolling opponents. I think since UW, they've won by an average of 23 points. And, and then the front seven defensively, they're veteran late in the offensive line. Uh, they have to replace everybody who's in the NFL now. They haven't flinched. They run the ball well. Bo Nix is elite. This is going to be uh, two teams that I think can go win everything, not just a team that maybe can get in a four seed. I think if UW wins, they should be considered as a possible one seed. Nobody has had what they've had to do. They're 6-0 yeah. against ranked teams. Nobody even plays six ranked teams. Nobody's it's playing Chattanooga in week 11, bro. I mean, this is, <laughs> as you know, uh, this year, the most challenging conference in the country. You really want some great options you need to get Factor Meals. Go to factormeals.com slash Andy50. That's Andy50 to get 50% off your purchase. These are fresh, never frozen meals. They're delivered to you in a refrigerated box. You put them right in the fridge. You can open them within two minutes. They are heated up, ready to go. 
and they are delicious. 35 plus chef crafted meals every week and the menu rotates, support a healthy lifestyle. Can be calorie smart, vegan, veggie, protein plus. Uh, my wife has celiac disease. We had to do gluten free options so that if she grabs one, make sure there's no gluten in there. They're very open, upfront, honest about what is in each one. They, they have a list of allergens on every single one so you know what you're dealing with. Uh, I highly recommend the Chipotle rub pork chop with roasted cabbage and red bell pepper fondue. It is spectacular. Uh, the herb crusted chicken with mashed cauliflower and toasted almond green beans. Awesome. They do a really good job with the cauliflower. They have the mashed cauliflower in some of the meals, the rice cauliflower in some of the meals. It's very good for you. So go to factormeals.com slash Andy50 and use the code Andy50 to get 50% off your purchase. It is awesome. When they came, the box first came, the, my kids cleared them out, cleared me out. They were taking them for lunches. My, mo- my wife would grab them, take them for lunch to work. We were hooked, and now we are regular Factor customers. It is really interesting, and I think a lot of it has to do with the Vegas line on this game, with Oregon being almost a double-digit favorite. Like it almost people aren't even thinking about the idea of Washington winning, but Washington winning this game at thirteen and zero, the resume is pretty undeniable at that point. Yeah, I mean, right now they've got the highest strength of schedule among everybody who's undefeated. I think Georgia might be up one or two slots, but after this game, it will it'll right. flip. Right, it'll be it'll be UW all day long. I think when you look at their games too, you know, I can remember being on the USC coaching staff when we were undefeated. It is hard. It's way different than when you lose a game. Like it's much different than Alabama. You lose a game and then mm-hmm. backs against the wall, or Oregon lose the game. It, when the chips just continually get stacked on top of you, and you get everybody's best. I mean, that that's exactly what they've had, and they've met the moment. I mean, they've won every one score game. Right when they needed a play, they made a play. A lot of times that's been defensively. We know what Roma Dunze and Michael Penix Jr. and this receiving core can do, but they're only getting stronger now. Jalen McMillan came back last week, five grabs. He's going to be at full strength. Uh, they get um, a Giles Jackson back mm-hmm. for this game because he only played in four. They're preserving his redshirt, but the redshirt rule doesn't apply to postseason, to postseason. play. Wow. Yeah, and this is a postseason game. So th- this team in the back end, uh, it, I wouldn't be surprised if Asa Turner played, the quarterback of their secondary. Th- this will be an epic game, and I think that point spread is great. For both teams, it's great for Oregon because it's showing the respect that they're they're given. Personally, man, I think they're playing the best football among anybody in the country, including Georgia, including Michigan in the back half of the season. So it's great that they're favored. If they can go win this game, because then they'll go get into the playoff, as they should. If they, yeah. they have earned that, in my opinion. And then on the flip, if UW wins, wow, they just beat a team that they weren't favored to win. They have the resume we just described. And I'm hoping that they can climb and get a seed that puts them in a position to play at the Rose Bowl, because that's exactly what should happen. Now, UW, people probably don't want to hear this comparison, but they do remind me, the second half of the season, not the first half, the second half of the season, a lot like TCU last year, Mm. where there was a lot of finding a way and winning in different ways. I know they don't want that comparison because TCU lost the conference championship game, and I don't think you can do that this time and and make it in. So uh, they've got to figure out how to win it. But yeah, it, it feels like... Oregon has been so good since that loss that the nobody is even pondering the idea of Washington winning this game. Yeah, I know, man. It's 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 wild to think about, uh, and and I'm not really sure why. Because when I go back and I've watched every snap of every team for 20 years in this league, but specifically to this year, you go and you watch who they've had to play. Right. Let's look at SC and they got their absolute best shot. SC lost the next two games. Then they play Utah. They, they had a chance to blow that thing open. It would have been 40 28 mid third quarter, but they fumble it going in on a pick six. Right. They get a safety, I think, the very next snap. And it's a tight game, but they don't allow us point in the second half. Utah went and lost their very next game. Then they go on the road at Oregon State. And we all know everything that's gone on in the Pac 12 and the Pac 2. They get their very best. They win on a back shoulder fade ball to their best player, to Roma Dunze again for Michael Penix Jr. in a pouring rain, absolute, uh, you know, c- complete downpour. But they get their best, and Oregon State loses the next week. And then they get the Apple Cup. We all know what that rivalry is, but also the realities around college football and the Pac-12 and, and Washington State. They get their best. And I just say that of like, not only are they getting everybody's best shot, but we used to call it back in the day the Trojan hangover. Everybody would mm-hmm. lose after they yeah. gave us their best shot. The same thing's happening to UW. 
So it's it's just different when you comping those two teams. But but I also think it's it's fair to say that Oregon has been rolling opponents. You know, yeah. Penix has had Heisman moments because they've had tight games. Bo Nix is lucky if he plays in the fourth quarter because right. he has four or five touchdowns in the first half. And and Bo Nix is a, a completion percentage is just amazing to me. Like he may finish with a seventy eight percent completion percentage, which would be the highest in the history of the FBS. And it is not, they do have a lot of high confidence passes built into that offense, but he's, he's going for some air yards quite yeah. often. And the guys are open. That. I'm so. glad you said that, man. Like we, when we called their game a couple weeks ago and, and had that graphic up on purpose of where is he completing the ball? And this is not playing catch. That's how I describe a lot of those offenses, high percentage throws, completions, as you referenced. He's playing quarterback. You go back and you talk to Will Stein, their offensive coordinator, one of the top coordinators in the country. His foundation is based in the West Coast. So if we got to stand up like in the press box and watch Oregon's offense, you would see a lot of triangles. And that would make Bill Walsh really happy. So like, <laughs> imagine a receiver, a receiver, a receiver. And he's got to make that triangle read. This is not pure progression i don't care what the defense does just get the ball out to whoever's open and play catch he's playing quarterback and that to me is what makes this so impressive i mean just look at where he's throwing the football down the field intermediate routes tez johnson over routes tight ends corner routes uh go balls to troy franklin i mean yes they've got some screens built in some tunnel screens built in of course they do what offense doesn't but he is he is thriving at the position and I think because of the way the award, the Heisman Trophy, is defined, which is a reminder for our fellow voters, it's excellence with integrity. He's competing with excellence. And he's competing on a stage where excellence will be rewarded with the playoff berth. And I love Jaden Daniels as much as anybody. I mean, he was in the pack. We've had him at Elite 11. He's a baller. But they're not playing in a title game, right? He hasn't done it against the best. You look at the schedule the last month of the season. Uh, I think it was Georgia State in week 11. Like mm -hmm. you just I believe have to put some of that into context. Well, they, they did and have Florida State in week 1 when when Tory was not playing a really good opponent. So, but I, I will say this, what what fascinates me about this particular Jane Daniels and Bo Nix is usually it, it comes down to geography and you've got the guy from the SEC and the guy from the the Pac-12, but Jaden Daniels is the West Coast guy. Yeah. And Bo Nix is the Southern guy. Like, it's very strange. It is. It is so strange. Like, what's interesting about the Heisman, uh, I didn't learn this till probably, I think the Mariota year was maybe the first year mm -hmm. I ever went to the Heisman or Christian McCaffrey, one of those years, whoever was first. Um, but when it's over, they give you this envelope and they show you the breakdown of the yep. regions. I'm so curious, like, where does Michael Penix draw? Right? Any Midwest votes? Right. To your point of Bo Nix. He's from, he gets, and he's from Florida. And he's, yeah, he's from yeah. Tampa. You're right. Yeah. So I, I don't know how it'll shake out. I, I just hope that the voters don't vote. You know, like I saw some clips about, you know, Brian Kelly, uh, you know, of course, doing what any head coach would do. And you should politic for your for your players. But let's let the games play out. I've never understood why the Heisman Trust even sends out the opportunity yeah. to vote prior to the final yeah, vote, game. Vote it causes a games. stir. You yeah, see, it always have... causes a stir. You have two more days after the games to vote. You can wait. It, it takes. I'm a voter. It takes five minutes to submit once you've decided who you who you're going to vote for. So it's not a problem. But yeah, I I will be waiting until Sunday at some point, and I'll send that in. But it, it is it is amazing how how the dynamics of that are going. But let's talk about Oregon in general because you mentioned what they've done out of the transfer portal, the new players. And I think Kyrie Jackson, Jordan Birch, guys like that on the defense, it feels like Dan Lanning built this defense to make sure what happened against Oregon State last year never happened again. And I think you saw it in the, in the Civil War. Like, they're not, they weren't going to let them do that to them. And it's obviously not something Washington's going to do. Yeah, I, th I think you're right on that. Um, you know, I think year one, when you take over a program, you're trying to like figure out who the team is, get, what what pieces you have to fill. I think year two, it's about like what pieces do you need to dramatically add, not just fill spots. So you look at a Johnny Cornelius at right tackle, mm -hmm. the yep. only old lineman that's starting via the portal. You reference Jordan Birch. He wasn't just a body on the defensive line. He was a dominant body. You look at Justin Jacobs, at linebacker from Iowa. This guy who wasn't healthy really in the back end of his career at Iowa, but he's thrived since he started playing around midseason for this defense. And then I think the thing for both of these teams that doesn't get enough love is the players in the trenches have been there for a mm -hmm. long time. Oh, yeah. 
right? You look at Popo Amavai, seventh year player. Yep. And then here's Mateo Uyangale, true freshman. And yep. in between Brandon Dorless, fifth, sixth year. You just look at these guys. They, they played a lot of football. Same thing for Washington. Braylon Trice, fifth year player. Zion Tupelo Fatui, been there for five or six years. At a Fuanyola Fashio at linebacker, sixth year player. Asa Turner, like guys that have just been there. And I think there's something when we look at these teams all competing for a CFP berth, none of them have had to flip the core of their roster in terms of in the trenches. They've all developed that. Yeah. And I think that's something to track as I know the portal date mm -hmm. comes up. You'll be all over that here in a, in a handful of days. Uh, everybody wants a bunch of new guys on the defensive front. Doesn't always mean you're going to win and win big. And I think that's a good example on Friday night in the Pac-12. Well, the, the those guys are hard to find. I mean, we talk about a, a Johnny Cornelius, but of the 10 starting offensive linemen in this game, he's the only one from the transfer portal. Yeah. The, 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 I'd say the more accurate story when it comes to Oregon is like Josh Connerly, which is Dan Lanning gets there, big recruiting battle with USC. They win, they develop the guy, and here he is as a sophomore, kind of showing that he was worth the recruiting hype. Yeah, and even the development around that, right? He was their extra offensive lineman all of last year, mm -hmm. kind of in their jumbo packages, just working him into the system and then sliding into a starter. I look at the same thing with a lot of players. Look at the secondary and how they've had to rotate so many bodies, but they play a lot of bodies. Yeah, I think Dan Lanning, you, you walk through their facility, and I love it's got this thing they call it their DNA traits, connection, growth, toughness, and sacrifice. And and he really has leaned in, as has Kalen DeBoer, to the idea of connecting to players. And I think when we look at you know the portal coming up um, and reflecting upon the season or looking towards this weekend's games, the most connected teams are, I think, the ones that are still playing. Right? There was a clip that just went viral, Steve Sarkeesian, talking about mm -hmm. his culture and how connected yep. the team is. Same thing with Dan Lanning. Kaylin DeBoer, both of these guys have allowed me really inside their facilities, man. And they work at it. They really work at the relationship yeah. versus just get, getting talent in the building. And, and it's like I have Chris Peterson chirping in my ear now. Yogi, mm -hmm. culture still wins. Culture still has to win. You know, connectivity has to win. Relationship still wins. Not just star rankings, not right. just ability. And I think we've seen that play out in a bunch of different programs this fall. Well, and so I saw it at Michigan this past weekend. But the, another thing I noticed in that game in Ann Arbor, and I was thinking about this as I was you know, writing about the game, we were praising Sharon Moore for his aggressiveness on fourth down in the first half. Went for it three times, got it three times. It was no different situationally than Dan Lanning going for it three times and not getting it three times <laughs> in the Oregon-Washington game. If you're Dan Lanning, do you stay as aggressive as you were and say, you know what? If we get one of those, we win. So we just keep doing it. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, other than the one before half, I think you know, he's going right. to take the points. Yeah, you know, what, the points really, yeah, what, I, what I really appreciated about Dan Lanning, I, I'd imagine you'd agree because you've gotten to know him too, is – he's always said from day one, like he's got to have a growth mindset. I, I referenced their DNA traits mm -hmm. and there were multiple times last year, this year, he's like, I'm learning as a head coach still. I haven't been doing this as long as Nick Saban, Kirby Smart. And and I love that about the humility that he continues to showcase because I think it's really reflective of his team. You yeah. know, they have this phrase up there where they call it like, go to the doctor. So every Monday you got to take your medicine, right? <laughs> where did I, where can I learn? You know, where did I, you know, misstep where did i call a play where i shouldn't have as an oc or as a defensive coordinator or where did i have a misread or a misstep on the offensive front and i and i love that because it's really become embedded into the ethos of who they are but to answer your question my favorite part of getting to know coaches personalities is that you can kind of predict when games are tight yeah. what are they going to go be who are they going to go be what are they going to go do and dan lanning is going to be aggressive ryan yeah. grubb kaylin DeBoer, they're going to be aggressive this is not going to be a play field position type of game by any stretch i imagine from jump it won't be reckless but it is going to be aggressive on both sides well and, and it's interesting you talk about learning as a head coach kalen DeBoer is so much more experienced as a head coach than dan lanning because kalen DeBoer was a very young head coach at the nai le nai level at sioux falls winning national titles i i it's i find it interesting that dan lanning worked with kirby smart because I think back to Kirby Smart in that national title game that he lost to Alabama on second and 26. Like, it's his second year as a head coach. You have so much you still don't know. And then the following year, he calls the terrible fake punt in the SEC championship game. It cost him a playoff berth. And then look at him now. 
clearly he's learned from those experiences and become a better coach. We're just seeing the tip of the iceberg on Dan Lanning and what he can be. Yeah, and I think that's that's really well said. And to the point of like fake punt works and he's a legend, right? Mm-hmm. Fourth downs work and Coach Lanning is a legend, much like what you referenced in Michigan over the weekend. Uh, that, that's just kind of part of it. Uh, but but you're right. I mean, so much of this at that role and that seat is about growth. And and I love that. And, you know, I talked to Pete Carroll about it. He, he's still growing as a head coach. And this is second oldest <laughs> coach right. in the NFL. Yeah. You know, like, and, and if you think you've got it nailed, you're just wrong. And, and I love that about Dan. And I think to the point of Oregon, he's not going anywhere, right? He's going to have every opportunity to, to go to every job. And this is how it works. I can remember back in the day at SC when I was there, every opening, they would just call. Hey, Pete, just want to make sure you're not interested. Are you interested? <laughs> is it, that's how it works. I mean, yeah. I've talked to ADs where they're like, yeah, we always just call to see if Saban wants the job. Might you as never well. Know. never know. You yeah. call everybody. Th- that's where Dan Lanning and Kalen DeBoer are. And I don't see either one of them going anywhere for a while, man. Um, it's a high-pressure job. I think we might be entering an era where coaches don't coach for like 20 years at, at one place. Like they might need a break after a decade or something like that. Take yeah. a sabbatical per se. But these two love where they are. And that's why I think this rivalry is so great. Uh, you know, it, it pains me to see them, you know, go to the Big Ten. But I, it also brings me great joy to know they're always going to play each other. Because well, this is I'll, a game that's good for the game. I also think because they're going to the Big Ten, you, you don't have to worry about Dan Lanning and Kalen DeBoer. I mean, maybe if like an NFL team decided they wanted Kalen DeBoer, that's a different thing to think about. But, yeah, I, I came up with the two-question test when it came to Lanning. And it's, you know, are you, are you at an SEC or Big Ten job now? which it'll be a Big Ten job next year. And then can you consistently finish in the top three of that league? Not every year, but but a lot of years. Absolutely, Oregon can do that. So why would you ever leave? Yeah, I'm with you, man. And they've got all the like the resources to do well. He said that from day one. We all know the inequities in college football and, and what they are. Well, Oregon doesn't have any. You know, they got a rabid fan base. They've got a great culture. They've got a rich history of winning, especially recently. Uh, Kids all over the country want to go play there. Just look at their roster. You see players from the East Coast, from the Midwest, from, of course, the West Coast. And, and I don't think it's it's going anywhere. And it's become a launching pad for assistance. Mm-hmm. Uh, look at the interest in Will Stein. From yep. other Kenny look Dillingham, with, already yeah. a head coach. Yep. Yeah, so so it's going to be uh, it's going to be a blast. Same thing with Washington. I really think they're set up to be powers. Uh, I think they would have been that way in the pack as well, right? Uh, yep. But regardless... I don't think they walk into the Big Ten. I think five years ago, maybe you would have said, oh, wow, like they're maybe not a tier one school in the Big Ten because the pack had been down. But you look at them now, and I think all of us that follow college football knew that once the portal and NIL opened and that became reality, that the West Coast schools were going to have a dramatic resurgence. And that's exactly what's happened, especially at those two. So I don't see them slowing down. I love they still recruit high school versus just you know, going to the portal for everything. I think that's the way to win and win big. And you're right. These are two teams that will play every year for a chance to go to the playoff and and maybe even both to your point, go to the playoff. Well, have fun. I wish I could be there with you on Friday. I was at the the USC Utah Pac-12 championship last year and and Vegas is such a great venue for that, that kind of game. So have fun and uh, enjoy this one because I I imagine this is going to be another classic. Yeah, man, I I'm, I can't wait. You know how it is. The last like, five minutes of the game, like the reporters go downstairs to get into the field. I will be down there as early and as often as humanly possible because I just want to feel what it is like on the floor of Allegiant Stadium. It should be an epic one with a ton at stake. And always appreciate you, man. You're one of the best in the world doing what you do and, and appreciate all the support and love. My pleasure, Yogi. Thank you so much. Got it, man. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder... Subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On 3 Sports YouTube channel.